right. I got Dave here. Uh, I, I think that... You know, we want to w- welcome everybody here. Um, speaking of that, speaking of that... Celinda. You know, we want to welcome everybody here. Everything all at once? Everything all at once. It's honestly a sensation. Aliens listen to it. I want to give this to you. Oh, thank you. That's oh, wow. Oh, nice. Thank Amazing you. Amazing storytellers. If you liked The Witch's Fleet, you'll love that. I'm super excited. I can't wait to read it. I'm going to, it's going to be on the back burner for a little bit. I got one, we have one more author coming in in a couple months, so I'm going to read their book, but I will, I definitely will get to this because I okay. did greatly enjoy Witch's Fleet. Uh, today we have with us the writers of The Witch's Fleet, a local eerie novel, John Corrigan and Abigail Weech. Hello. It's, it's great to have you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Abby's been a longtime friend. This is the first time we're meeting John. It's uh, super great to have you both in the studio. Abigail, it feels weird calling you Abigail. It does. You don't have to call me that. <laughs> but, <laughs> you can call me but, Abby. And we can call you Abby? Okay, good. Because uh, Abigail feels, sounds weird, but it looks great on the book. It's it perfect for the book. And uh, it's all about local, eerie stuff. We also have Celinda here with us. Hello, hello. Hey. And uh, it's all about the history and the War of 1812 and the story that went along with it. It has all real characters, from what I can tell, um, that are like historically landmarked throughout Erie. Uh, John, are you originally from Erie? Uh, no. Originally, I was born in Cleveland, but I grew up in Maidville. Okay. I uh, went to Edinburgh. And raising my kids here, and we spent tons of time on Presque Isle. So cool. it was like uh, I knew the story, and I knew that I wanted to write the story at some point. Yeah, we. I remember learning a little bit about it in like grade school or elementary school, maybe middle school. I don't quite recall, but I feel like I learned so much more from, from reading your book. Well, I was approached by <clears throat> a gentleman who's on the board of directors for the Ni- Niagara League. And his daughter had bought him uh, the storytellers for his birthday, and um, he got he loved the storytellers, and he uh, got in touch with me and invited me to lunch. And he asked me, he said, uh, "Could you do something like this, meaning the storytellers, for us?" Because he said um, most people in Erie don't know their own history, which makes them the same as people anyplace else. Right. Um, right. And especially the early history of Erie. Uh, having been founded in 1795, in 1811, Erie was brand new. And all the people who lived here were from some someplace else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the book it says there were about 400 or 500 people <clears throat> to start us off. And then once the, uh, the war got started, everybody started flooding in here. Well, it became a boom town, a military base. And the U.S. government poured a lot of money into Erie. So that's when Erie really takes off. But I was really interested in nascent eerie in other words what it was like before Mm -hmm. it hit the fan yeah it was crazy to like imagine like you i feel like you did a very good job describing like how the town was before everybody showed up and it was just so weird to imagine just like that tiny little town like people living right on presque isle Mm -hmm. and i yeah it was really cool because like i've lived in erie my entire life and i haven't heard a lot of this story so it's been it, definitely very interesting to well, learn about. Everybody was down by the bay. If you were out on 8th Street, you were on the out, outskirts of town. Right. The, uh, um, and, and like I said, they were all from someplace else. When Daniel Dobbins washes ashore mm-hmm. and brings the news that Detroit has been captured without firing a shot, and that they're at war, oh, by the way, because <laughs> none of them knew that. Uh, and most of them had relations on the other side of the lake. They did business with them, as Daniel Dobbins did. So it was a shock that, oh, my God, we're at war with the British Empire. What are we going to do? And the first conversation is, do we stay or do we go? Right. And that's a, that's a huge decision these people have been making, like, their livelihood here. And uh, that whole the whole aspect of the book that was really interesting and I thought was really well done and is a credit to you as a writer is how time goes by in the book. Um, You know, it travels from week to week to month to month um, as the things are progressing along in Erie and it just shows that like, oh, like we can't just call our friends, you know, anymore or text them and let them know that there's a war afoot and nobody's seeing it on Facebook. And uh, I thought that was a really interesting part. Another part that I really liked as far as the writing goes, was that it really, like the language and the verbiage feels like it's from 1812. Yeah. 
Where do you, where did you learn to write like that or I, like the language I, like that? I actually bought the movie Pride and Prejudice, mm -hmm. at which the book was written in 1812. So, um, and it, the the version that I got with was uh, faithfully done. Uh, Kira Knightley stars stars in it. And um, but that's how they talked. Right. In other words, it, it's like Shakespeare, but not quite that rough. You know, that's mm -hmm. it's like you can understand it. Right. Right. So right. it was like, but they did have a way of turning a phrase, which I really liked, and I tried to spin that in to the conversations between the characters. Is that this is what they would just the way they would end a sentence or something like that would be just a little different mm -hmm. than we would do today. Yeah, because it's not a dramatic change. It's just like little key words and different phrasing in it and uh i thought it was really well done thank you i was downtown earlier today and i was looking at i was in perry square oh yeah and yeah. i was looking at the courthouse and then you have like a little map in the beginning and it doesn't have any street names on it mm -hmm. and i was looking at the courthouse i'm like is that the old courthouse or they like the erie club i wasn't sure if because i know that's an old building too and it wasn't always the erie my, club. my understanding was the original courthouse that's men mentioned in the book was in the center of the square oh really uh, whereas the the new courthouse in the square is open now but, mm -hmm. it, but that's my understanding is that's the way it was so uh, as a matter of fact i was wondering where the hospital was and a lot of people in erie just <clears throat> couldn't do enough to straighten me out and put me on the right path about when I said, where's the hospital? They said, oh, the hospital was in the courthouse. The courthouse wasn't used as a courthouse that often with a village of, four, right. of, of 400. So they would press it into service as they did with that plague mm -hmm. uh, when they were had so many sick people at at one time was it's like they'll use the courthouse because it was the biggest building in town. Right. It seems like they were really doing their best to make do with what they had available in that given circumstance because you know his town of 500 people isn't super prepared to be no, taking they, people from a plague or people that have been injured in battle or all these things so many things were happening so quickly and everything was coming at them um the sickness the war the 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 raids the mm -hmm. attempts to burn the fleet before it can be launched i mean that all happened um the, uh, I noticed that uh, you liked the diary of Usher Parsons that I posted today. Yeah. Uh, that was my, one of my source books, and it was a day-by-day a, a -day accounting of what he was doing in Erie, how he was treating the sick, uh, his, how he described the plague. Mm -hmm. uh, modern physicians say from what he's describing, it sounds like malaria, which is like would be totally out of place here. It would be in the tropics but right. it was like um, and it didn't occur that sickness didn't occur in buffalo or across the lake or it was just here mm -hmm. in erie it was one of the coincidences that abby and i came across as we were doing the research is like all of these things oddities were happening and i said to abby while we were recording the uh, the audio version of of the uh, storytellers I said, you know, there's room for a witch in this story if we wanted to do it, mm -hmm. because Abby would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Abby, how much did you help with all this writing? Like, yeah, how did really you guys divvy up the work? And like, how with two authors, like, how do you guys collaborate in creating like one cohesive story? Well, I didn't do the writing. That is all, Mr. John Corrigan. He is the wordsmith here. Um, I think actually you'd probably be able to explain your process a little bit better than I would. I've, I've been writing since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And even in junior high, I would write short stories, and usually in study hall or something like that. But I can't write in a vacuum. I've got to have an audience. So it would be like I'd write something. And way back then, it was a young lady by the name of Pam Kern. And she would look at me. She goes, well, what are you writing? And I so I will appear or look at it. And she'd go, this is junk. Throw it back at me. <laughs> wow. she, she was my first critic, but that meant I wanted to write something that she wouldn't throw back in my right. face. Right. Yeah. So it was like I started writing better stuff because she demanded it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was, but then I found it was kind of like a mechanism that I needed was I needed to, to write a chapter and then immediately either read it to somebody or send it to somebody. Mm -hmm. And so that became a key person in my, if I, if I don't have that person, I cannot write. It's like, I, I'll try to write, but it was like, um, yeah, I won't be su successful at it. And when I met Abby, Abby was interested in the story of, w of what I was doing with uh, the storytellers. And 
I would email a chapter to Abby. And it's like about, I think it was like every other week, and then we got to one week every chapter. Well, the way I would write every chapter is crafted to answer a question and ask a question. So that it's designed to pull the reader through the book. Mm -hmm. I want to make it so it's hard to stop. If somebody gets halfway through the book and stops, I want to know where it was because yeah. there's a problem there. Right. So it's like I should be able to pull you through the book. Well, poor Abby getting a chapter <laughs> once a week is like she's now going, when do I get the next yeah, chapter? Yeah, that's torture. Oh, we, the, uh, the one chapter towards the beginning, I think it's the New Year's Eve 1812 chapter where there's the blizzard mm -hmm. and they can't see their hands in front of their faces. And uh, the British and their native allies decide that we're going to raid now. And it's like, so this dog is tethered to like a 20 foot rope and it's barking at something in the snow. And so this becomes a really neat scene that I can write where the, the, the soldier sentry goes out and all he can see is the, the, is the rope disappearing into the storm wow. yeah. and then gradually though the rope is going from right to left in other words the dog is barking furiously at something that's moving from right to left and so all of a sudden his sergeant is standing behind him and he says uh, let him go let him go he says we'll follow his tracks and we'll kill whatever out what whatever's out there so the scene then shifts to duncan's tavern and they can hear the gunshots and then the screams and everything like that. And that's where the chapter ends. Oh, no. And I, right. send, I send it to Abby. Oh, man. Great cliffhanger. <laughs> She gets right back to me. What happened to the dog? Uh, <laughs> that's the only question I asked. Is the I, know, I was so glad that you put that in there about what happened to the dog because I was like, no. Well, we got the idea. Let's make the dog, especially since I knew I, I hit a nerve. It's like, yeah. okay, the dog's fine, uh, reappears in the next chapter, but then the dog goes on as a regular character. Yeah, he's awesome. A, a super dog. So this is like a wonder dog. Um, what was interesting was when I was doing my research at the Maritime Museum, and they were wonderful there, one of the curators said to me, uh, and do you know about Perry's dog? Oh, and, I went, and I went, what? And he goes, yeah, he adopted a dog when he came to town. And he and ended up leaving with it. And it was like I said to Abby, it's like, okay, this is getting a little freaky. Yeah. You know, that all <laughs> of a sudden. And, and it goes back to why I write the type of books that I do and why I try to focus on the smaller people Perry's in there, and but but um, Dr. Usher Parsons and Nancy Duncan, who was a real pe a, a real person, mm -hmm. and she marries um, uh, Joe Roberts on, on the Fourth of July of. 1813. It's right. like that actually happened. I wasn't able to find out what happened to them after that. There is a Nancy Duncan buried in the cemetery, but I don't think it's her. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was like so the idea of the dog and going back and forth with Abby is like you get feedback immediately because she's hungry to get the next chapter right so it's like she gets it and bang i get something right away and then we usually end up talking on the phone for a while about it but it's a perfect formula we wrote the book in a year we started on january 1st of 2021 and finished it up at christmas that's pretty it's pretty impressive yeah pretty yeah. quick pace we got a real rhythm going and by the end it was every five days a new chapter was going back and forth cool and are there any big parts that you can take credit for abby or any changes that you suggested that you were particularly proud of? It looks like John knows. Yeah, John definitely well, knows. I, I can tell you. The witch, for one. Okay, the idea. Because she when, when I did the storyteller, she was my horse expert. My, and it was like, when we're doing the witch's fleet, she's my witch expert. Mm -hmm. Okay, from the totem of the gull wings to the necklace to the all of the stuff that goes in there. That's right out of Abby. I, mean, I figured. You know, yeah, I was that's, reading that's, that's about like the witches. Abby. I was like, this is Abby. Yeah, this is Abby. This is like... Uh, Modeled after real clothing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the coat that the... Uh, the coat... As a matter of fact, we're going to do... Um, we're working with uh, Menagerie Studio to do... Yeah, they're great. I love Jess. Well, yeah, they're going to be, be a... Uh, we're going to do... Nick. Yes, both of them. Yeah. We're, we're going to... You can't leave one out. Right. So um, we're going to do a national trailer because we're going to do a national release of the book. And by that, I mean we're going to do national advertising for wow. it. So that... But we're going to stress in this one the Wiccan part of the book mm -hmm. uh, because what I've discovered is that there's a large community out there. Mm -hmm. Sure. A lot of yeah, people definitely. interested. Very passionate about yeah. that stuff too. And so this is where Abby comes in. Cool. That's great. And I loved the, the twist at the end too about the witches. It was, I don't want to give away any spoilers. Well, don't do that. Yeah, but it, it was awesome. It, it all fit together 
just like it was supposed to. You know what I mean? With, uh, with everything going on. And I liked the aspect of unlikely allies or unlikely bedfellows throughout the book, or at least with concerning the witch, you know, because she makes some friends in the town and uh, they wouldn't be people that she would normally look to for uh, friendship or support or anything like that. But the greater good really seems to triumph and drive everybody in a positive direction to work with each other. Well, again, this is Abby's input into the book is the difference between a gray witch and a dark witch, mm -hmm. and which I had no clue. I have no idea. It's like, I'm lucky if I spell it correctly. So it's like, but she says, no, she goes, the gray witch, she goes, the gray witch is like, cause no harm, but take no shit. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. that's an Abby quote. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, the dark witch is just evil. I yeah, she's awful. Hmm? That's, that's a quote. I stole it from is the a good quote. <laughs> it is a good quote, honestly. But it's good, yeah. And uh, it was a really wonderful book, and I'm glad that you guys both worked together on it. Um, where did your interest? So, have you been interested in like eerie history? I know you mentioned you started writing when you were younger. Did you did this? fascination with history start back then as well when i was at edinburgh i was a history major because my original goal was to be a teacher mm -hmm. and i was going to teach history and i uh, got a job as a bartender like junior year and then everybody told me i should be a psychologist so i switched my major so ah. now my books are kind of like the psychology of history right so um but it is about what motivates people, especially the little people. Uh, for instance, and I'll, I'll use the character Nancy Duncan again. Um, she's mentioned a lot in uh, Usher Parsons' diary. Uh, they all liked Nancy. She's like the she's she's the Cinderella type character that's slaving away in her family's inn, mm -hmm. and she has to do all the work. And but everybody likes her. I mean, she's this this likable person. Uh, at, at times, I kind of describe her as uh, she moves in and out of the shadows unnoticed like their tankards of ale are suddenly right. filled up and it's like they didn't even see her go by she's mm -hmm. like this faceless personage but in parson's diary he's talking about how scared to death she was uh that the british were going to show up at any minute and the one chapter when they do is like everybody's scared to death and that's how it would have been the one of the things about studying history and it's inevitable we study history from the platform of the present so that i mean we have to so we already know how it worked out mm -hmm. you know but they didn't the mm -hmm. people li living on the edge of now as it was being pushed through the nancy duncans the usher parsons it's like they had no idea how this was going to work out for them there was tons of intrigue and drama and that's what i wanted to put in the book yeah it, w it was really great and i really loved uh I had always kind of admired Oliver Hazard Perry um, when we learned about him in middle school or elementary school or whenever that was. And it was really cool to see a more in-depth look at why he was admired so much as like a war hero and as a charismatic charismatic person and a leader and all these things. That's what I picked up from reading Usher Parsons and Noah Brown and the other historical characters, what they wrote, and uh, Harm Jan Heidi Cooper, who was a Meadville person, about in their letters afterwards about how impressed they were with Perry. Mm -hmm. was the, And in history, I mean, the, that book before you is about George Custer. I mean, as I was doing my research on this, I found I didn't like George Custer. Okay, uh -huh. but I was doing my research on on the, the witch's fleet, I liked Perry. As a matter of fact, Usher Parsons, and it, it isn't mentioned at the end, goes on and serves with Perry, and he's with Perry when he dies. Uh, they, 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 they had never met before Erie, but they formed this fast friendship, and Usher Parsons just thought he was a man that, that I could follow. Um, the uh, um, President um, Roosevelt, the um, not FDR, but, um, Teddy. Teddy, thank you. <laughs> was his name? Um, Teddy Roosevelt in 1913, the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Lake Erie, speaking about Perry, said, he goes, almost any naval officer of the time could have won the battle. He said, the real feather in his cap is building the fleet, because right. that was a gargantuan undertaking. And that, he goes through that in the book, too. Yes. He goes through those struggles and manages to, to assemble all the things that he needs and the people and rallies them, that, too. That's exactly what he did. He gets to Erie the next day he leaves for Pittsburgh because mm -hmm. they have nothing up here but wood. 
and water. So it was like everything is stuck in Pittsburgh. And that chapter I wrote is exactly what happened. The people he talks to, what he does, he takes the $100 and waves it over his head because the shipwrights are refusing to go to Erie because they're scared. And, and plus they're being paid a nice wage down in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh sure. was mm -hmm. a big shipbuilding place at the time and these shipwrights are coming from Philadelphia and Washington. They get to Pittsburgh and they're offered $2 a day, which was big money. Uh, to work in Erie. Well, they get to Pittsburgh and go, we'll give you $3 a day to stay here in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So it was like, and guess what they did? Yeah. So Perry did do that. He had to go down and he had to appeal to their patriotism. He had to bribe them with the money that he's waving over sure. his head. Mm -hmm. He had soldiers behind him with guns because they're supposed to go to Erie. But he got all that done. Yeah, and uh, I really liked him. It kind of goes back to Erie today and how it influenced us today. Like. Erie's always kind of been like a, a party city, you know what I mean? We like to celebrate, we like to, you know, go out and be friends and be social and we have all these gatherings all throughout the city and it's cool to be able to trace that back now through the different parts in your book where Perry's either rallying people or they're celebrating after a victory or whatever it is that's going on that the, the people of Erie and the community of Erie always seem to come together to enjoy each other and to enjoy the things that we have around us. The, the chapter where Perry's sitting at Duncan's in the snug at the table and she's waiting on him and he says how would you say our morale is here and it's like because morale wasn't very good they were all scared or sick or right and no one play so it was like he goes i think it's i think we'll have a party let's sell, let's have a party and it would be uh uh that scene the scene with the party and especially when um when dorcas forster who's a real person mm -hmm. uh, i discovered her name on a plaque over by the museum, it's 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 behind the museum about Dork, and of course I'm like Dorcas Forster. I'm using that. <laughs> right, definitely like, you have to. You know, when I sent that to Abby, Abby because she goes, "Is that a real name? Is a real pretty? <laughs> that's a real. I couldn't make that up. It's like Dorcas Forster and her sister make the flag." For, for Perry right. that says don't give up the shit. Classic, eerie yeah. stuff. Did you guys do to anything special to celebrate your, the book when you were done? Like, yeah. How do you personally celebrate when you finish writing a book? We went to um, Oliver's. Oh, yeah, okay. Of course, yeah, very of course, nice. very fitting. We, well, a year ago, just about a, little, about a year ago this time, I took a week and just stayed um, at the Hampton and walked to the bayfront and that's when i got i realized there was that bluff where hammett sits on and that that bluff is about like 50 feet 75 feet high it runs the length of it and it's always been there so the people in the town w would come to the edge of the bluff and look down on the bay and i could see i know this is going to sound like I could see those people standing on the bluff watching what was going on they were watching when they got the ships out over the sandbar. I mean, that was all true. Right, that was right. a big thing too. Well kept secret until the moment of. Yeah, the the um, th and I I tried to give the British and the Canadians their propers here too because it was like um, uh, these people had gone from being being friends one minute to blood enemies the next. Mm -hmm. So this this was a uh, um, there was a uh, and this is. Um, uh, Barclay, uh, the British Admiral, right. with, who's lost his left arm f uh, uh, fighting Napoleon, he's sent to uh, command the Great Lakes Fleet, and to him it's a backwater, like he's been demoted. And he figures if he can win this battle, he can get back to London, and he can get back to where he really wants to be. So, Yeah. I mean, it seems like everybody has their motivations throughout the book. And I don't think it sounds weird at all. I could only imagine after spending so much time researching and writing and doing all of these things to prepare and actually writing this book that it would make sense to me that I yeah. mean, I have dreams about podcasting ever since I started <laughs> this, you know what I mean? Yeah. I have visions of people coming in here and all this stuff so that makes, I feel like when we get very, very attached to something like uh, our history or our heritage or writing a book or whatever it is, it really starts to become a part of our being, at least for right. a while. I mean, you're writing intimate like details of their lives, you know? 
So getting into their minds, I'm sure you could definitely see those people standing up there. I wanted the readers to be able to identify with these characters as if you could see yourself walking the streets of 1812 Erie. And it would be like what it was like, what they were seeing. Um, towards the end, there's a young militiaman who's looking at the, the brigs that are they're on the blocks. They're, and it's the biggest thing he's ever seen. And, and he's walked there all the way from central Pennsylvania. This is based on a letter he wrote home to his folks about what he was seeing in Erie. And he, it was the most impressive thing he'd ever seen. He's looking at these giant ships, the biggest structures he's ever seen. And he's, he, the lake blew him away. This, this is, is, is like you... In his letter to his folks, he says, you all know, he goes, that the biggest body of water I've ever seen before was at the bottom of our well. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a new, but that, that young soldier existed. Right. And so I, and the fact that they draft him on board the vessel means that I can take, that's kind of a mechanism. You can take somebody who knows nothing about ships or anything so he can ask stupid questions. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? What's this for? It's like, well, that's what the reader is. The read, I, want, I want to put the reader on board the Lawrence for the battle so that you can see what's going on around you when they spread the sand on the deck so that you won't slip in the blood. And then later the blood is, is, is so thick it washes away the sand. This is like, uh, and, he's, and he can't hear anymore because his, his eardrums are ruptured from the, from the cannons going off. I think I did. I think I was able to put the reader on the deck of the Lawrence. Right. I think yeah, he definitely absolutely. did. Yeah, I think so. And so are JJ and Quentin, were those real people? Uh, or were those more like... I always do this. Okay. When when you read the storytellers, you're going to run up, up against this character called Abby Weech. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and now the thing is, though, when I was writing this mm -hmm. and I was sending the chapters to Abby, she gets back to me, ha, 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 ha. Like, she, she, <laughs> however, I used her persona as well. It helps, it helps me flesh out a character if I know the person. Sure. J.J. and Quentin Q., uh, were, were two guys that I hired back in my working life when I was a manager of people, and I hired them both. And um, uh, Q was African American, JJ was the whitest white guy on the planet. And it was like, but they they ended up being the best of friends. Mm -hmm. They had this camaraderie, and of course, I asked their permission to use their names, yeah. but I said I also want to use your relationship because I wanted to put that in the book. That these two guys go all there in chapter one, they're the last chapter, it's like they go all the way through. Right. They're brothers by the time they get all the way through. And, and that's one of the things I picked up on too, or kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, is these unlikely bonds or these unlikely friendships that form throughout uh, the book. And I remember early on, I felt I was very. I'm involved with a lot of Native American ceremonies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And. It's so interesting to hear one story throughout your childhood and adolescence and stuff like, oh, you know, everybody was great and they were all friends. And then as you get a little bit older and a little bit more experienced, you realize uh, that that wasn't exactly true 100 percent. And when I talk to you about the the topic or the part of the book that was concerning to me, I, um, I, it helped me realize that a lot of times the the commonality or the truth is often somewhere in the middle and it's either gray it's all gray different shades of gray i was really interested to read about that because like i felt compelled to like go off on my own and like read Good. about shenandoah after that chapter mm -hmm. because just of historical precedents you know of of how native americans have been treated in this country and i was like is this real and I, it was, it's such an interesting story, like with Samuel Kirkland coming to live with the Oneida tribe mm -hmm. and like converting all these people to Christianity and Sally Cooper, like yep. that, that shawl that mm -hmm. Martha Washington yep. gave her still exists. Yep. So that was a super interesting story to read. And like, I'm glad that your book inspired me to go and like read about that that makes me feel so good because the and when you read this one anybody who's read this book has told me is like you had me googling everything yeah, yeah. in other words because it's like who is this guy where is oh did this really happen was this really it's like yes it's all really there 
Um, I didn't do a lot of footnoting in the Witch's Fleet. I wanted to, but the, the, um, the editors were against it. They said it's distracting. Um, the Storytellers is, is heavily footnoted because mm -hmm. there is so much that you won't believe unless I tell you where you can go read it yourself. And I personally I, enjoy the footnotes. Oh, good, good. good. <laughs> yeah. I would. It's yeah. like I, I was hoping for more footnotes, actually. There were a lot of points where I was like, oh, man. And then I was really excited when there were footnotes for, for certain parts. But, you know. Well, the chapter one, the engagement between the USS Chesapeake <clears throat> and the HMS Leopard, that actually happened. And it was happening on a regular basis. Um, the British government, the British, the, the British Empire at the time, uh, the United States had just been a group of colonies of, of Britain, and so it was like, and they were had their hands full fighting Napoleon. The way they looked at it was, you should be fighting with us anyway, you know. You sh and so they would would stop a ship, and it, it wasn't just American ships; it was anybody's ship. And they needed trained sailors, and they could tell. By, and that's, I had to do a lot of research into this. It's like, how could they just board a ship and say you, 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 and you? And it would be like, well, that's because a sailor who has been doing it for a number of years has a build to them, their hands are black from the tar on the ropes. There's a, there's a bunch of things they would look for and say, I want you, I want you, I want you. When they see Jabari Moore go up the shrouds after his son, he goes, oh, I want him. Just right. by the way he did it. You know, it's like, oh, I, and I want him. So it was like, but that's, that's how they would do it. The British Empire kind of looked at the United States at the time, the way China looks at Taiwan today. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, you think you're independent, but we'll get you back. Right. right. So, and that's what they were looking at. Awesome. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see how the people do start to adapt to that ship life, too. Because I'm sure, because we have that one character you mentioned earlier, and he's like super ambitious and excited and really wants to get involved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, part of one of the main themes of this whole show that we're trying to do is to foster this sense of community within Erie, you know, and let people know about what's going on and support each other and all of those things, uh, which are important to me personally because I like it here, you know. I, everybody is always trying to leave. As we're as we're a teenager, you know what yeah. I mean. A lot of people end up coming back, and a lot of people yes. stay away. And uh, but that's a universal thing. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody wants to break out and find their sense of independence and stuff like that. I was talking to Linda Bola, who's the historian at the Maritime Museum, and she had read Chapter One, and she really liked it, and she wanted to read Chapter Two, and it's like. And I was talking to her about Nancy Duncan, the sixteen-year-old girl in Erie who wants to get out, and she goes. Well, everybody will identify with that character. Right. You know, it's like I want to, and she actually thinks to herself, "Oh, good, there's going to be a war. Maybe some excitement will come into my life." You know, right. so be careful what you wish for. Right. And then she ends up being scared. And oh, she was scared to death. That's very human too to just want what we to to want what we want until we actually have it, and then not want it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, what was I wishing for? Exactly. Um, you guys were down at the uh, the tall ships mm -hmm. thing down there as yeah. well. That must have been. A really, so I, I could imagine after spending all this time researching and doing all this work and writing a, an amazing book about it, that must have been pr a pretty surreal moment. To it be. was tremendously gratifying. And I'm learning my guerrilla marketing methods better yeah. now, too, because we did a lot of pre-publication advertising and little, little um, teasers about the book. And you get it out there so that when, oh, and by the way, we're going to be at the Tall Ships Festival, we're going to be, look for us, you know, all that stuff. We had people walk in and come right up to our booth and say, boom, this, this is why I came. It was awesome. crazy. Yeah. I love that trailer that you guys put out oh, the, before the book came out. Because, like, I, I obviously knew about it being friends with, with Abby and Alex. I knew about the book. But I didn't really know what it was about, and I watched that trailer, and I was like, oh, I want to read this book. This seems good. <laughs> this was actually Celinda's idea to, to get you guys to oh, come good. out of the show. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, so, I, um, I have a, what was, like, the most fun part about writing this book in particular for you? God, it was all a lot of fun. <laughs> it really was. Like, writing chapter one and sending it to Abby, and it's like, she goes nuts. It's like, so good. Here's chapter two, you know, and it's like, and then the, it just starts going. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, um, it, the, the whole process is fun. This is, it's, it's like, um, I, 
it took me 30 years to write the storytellers. Mm -hmm. It took me 30 years because I thought I had 30 years. Right. You know, it's one of those things. It's like I got all the time in the world. There's no. It's like the stage I am in my life now. I don't know how much time I got left. And it's like hopefully it's another 30 years. But right. Like, yeah. Right. And the thing I'm writing about is I'm writing about real people who you've never heard of. Well, they want their spirits on the other side. They want their story told. Or so I've been told. So it's like um, now I feel pressure. I feel pressure to get the books done. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I don't have 30 years. So it's and the other thing is not just 30 years of breathing oxygen. It's 30 years of having this energy, of having the creative spark, because that comes and goes. And it's, it's like it's one of the things that Abby was incredible for me is creating my creative spark. She motivated me. So the, and that's what I told everybody. It's like that matter. It was it's like without Abby, the witch is sweet. She's your muse. Right. Yes, yes, she's my muse. How did you guys first like you meet? This. So back when I worked at Smoky Bones, I was a server bartender for a long time, and every other Thursday, once I was on the bar, I would bartend in the mornings. I guess more like a glorified server, really. But I would bartend in the mornings, and about. Between 3.30 and 4, usually John and his buddy Kim would come in to have a couple drinks. Sometimes they'd get some chicken <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or sandwich. And the one day, it was, I think it was pretty slow, but he was talking about, it was a rifle. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this kind? And I pulled it up on my phone and he was just like, yeah, let me see that. Pass it around. <laughs> and then he ended up asking, he, I don't know if you asked me a question. Tell about or the you... headstones in Edinburgh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, he'd ended up asking me a question or saying something about horses. Yeah. And I was like, are you prepared? Are you prepared for this 10-hour <laughs> conversation? Because that's what it'll be. And he's like, yes. So I um, was able to fill in all the horse details and tack and whatever else goes along with those and then the one day he brought up um, a, a man named John Milton Taylor who is buried in Edinburgh Cemetery and he was killed in Gettysburg and he visits this guy every year visits the headstone every year and I actually went to that cemetery with Nick a very very long time ago just randomly one day and not only did I know the cemetery and I had seen that exact headstone? I had a whole gallery of pictures of it on my phone. Wow. <laughs> awesome. She's the only other person I know on the planet who's been through that cemetery. Yeah. So it created a, a like, we were kindred spirits. Right. And it was like, this is, um, I said to her one day for the storytellers, I said, I, I, I need a sexy horse. And, and she goes, <laughs> she goes, no one's ever asked me that question. She says, what would be like the sexiest horse? So it's like, in the Old West, if you had this horse, everybody would want it, mm -hmm. okay? They'd either buy it from you or shoot you off it to take the horse, okay? So she came up again with her phone, the picture of a, a golden palomino? Or? It was a palomino. I think we used an Appaloosa. Yeah. That yeah. One. Like a palomino Appaloosa. And it was like that horse rides through that book. And it was like and everybody wants that horse. So it's like it becomes a, a little running string through the through the plot of the horse cool. so it was like but that's abby that's like this is um when my kids read the read the storytellers it was like where did dad learn so much about horses because <laughs> um it's about an easterner from manhattan in 1877 who he's an investigator and he gets sent west uh so yeah he's been on a horse before but he doesn't really know horses so the idea is Okay, that's going to be me. So if I'm on a horse and I said, well, how long would it take a city slicker? Okay, if he was with a horse night and day, how long would it take before he and the horse bonded? And she goes, uh, two weeks max. It would be like, okay, so in that book, after two weeks, he and the horse are like this. So it was like, um, so she, she was, um, you can see the role that that she plays in, mm -hmm. in what I do. For, I wanted her on the cover of the book for the witch's fleet because this is her if she doesn't exist that book doesn't exist so mm -hmm. this is like uh, and of course my attorney says to me you didn't tell her that did you and it's like <laughs> yeah only, <laughs> only about a hundred times oh, right. so she uh, already knows it's that's too, too bad yeah she's on the back though you guys <laughs> oh yeah back. yeah yeah i checked it out yeah um 
much. As somebody who has, so you've published two books. Have you published more than two? Yeah, I did two gothic romance adventures. One called Gwen that came out in 2000 and, and its sequel, uh, Aiden, which came out in 2005. So as somebody who's published a couple of books, what it, what are your least favorite and your, sorry, your, <laughs> your favorite and your least favorite parts of publishing? Well, I think I, um, the, my least favorite part, and the publisher would know this, is people that don't return my phone calls and don't reply to my emails promptly. And I'm not talking like Abby fast. I'm talking like within a day right. or two. It's like this is, uh, uh, but I self-publish, which means I'm paying everybody. I'm okay. paying the editors. I'm paying the, the publisher. I'm paying the print people. I'm paying everybody. So this is like, so when I call you, I expect you to call me back. Right. Okay. The, the reason I do that is it gives me total control over the production. And also, I retain the copyrights. Oh, okay. uh, because wow. my, my goal is to turn these into um, a limited series on Netflix or a movie or something right. like that. And they're kind of written that way. Um, one of the editors said to me, this reads like a screenplay. And I says, well, yeah, kind of. That's the goal. That, that's what I'm looking for. You know? I would definitely be interested in The Witch's Fleet as a series. Oh, I would watch yeah. it. Yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I think it would be really good. It would put Eerie on the map. Well, not that we're not on the map, but it's cool yeah, to see but Eerie. For something well, good, culture. for something good, I feel like all the things we're on the map for are really bad. Right. <laughs> Living in Cleveland, I've run up against a lot of people who have never heard of the Battle of Lake Erie. Wow. And it's like, yeah, in that big body of water right there, it's like that's what happened in 1813. So this is, um, the idea is we're going to educate some people about a little part of history that, and the thing I like too is that um, I dedicated the book to the people of Erie. And I, I called them the descendants of heroes because to me, and especially the crew of the USS John Adams, which volunteered to a man to go to the Great Lakes, they settled here. And it was like, and it was a very diverse crew that the uh, po, uh, po, po oh, Hig hey. and, and uh, uh, well, there was JJ J. J. and Q, but those were based on actual characters. I mean, that, that were in the crew, they stayed here. So this was like their descendants walk the streets of Erie today and they don't know. Would you say that it is more difficult to write like historical fiction? Like, do you feel like there's more pressure because you want to get the story right while still taking your own liberties to create a story versus like something that's complete fiction, like your gothic romances? Would you say? Well, yeah, the more gothic difficult? romance adventures. I just picked a, a 1348 and ran with it. So right. It was like the right. only thing that's correct is the year. I made everything up. So it was like that's like like fairy dust. Uh, this, though, um, I learned a lot talking to George Deutsch, George Deutsch at the, the Hagen Center and Linda Bola at the museum and all these other people that had all, and they're telling me, and did you know about the dog? Did you know about uh, the relationship between Barclay and Perry, which was, they become fast friends right. after the war. Um, that, um, the, the, as a matter of fact, we had, um, we had a, a disagreement, Linda and I did, about what to do with Barclay's sword. And I said, because um, I had called her and I wanted to be correct. I said, so whatever happened to Barclay's sword? Is it in a museum somewhere or something, something like that? I was going to put it in the footnotes. And she goes, oh, it's with the Barclay family to this day because when Barclay offered it to Perry, he said, you can keep it, mm -hmm. which was the first generous thing. It was like, and after that, then Perry turns around to Dr. Parsons and says, I want you to treat their wounded as our own. And Barclay, who's wounded, says, he goes, that will be greatly appreciated. Then this friendship begins of, and it was, it was the type of thing that, and Usher Parsons writes about it in his uh, diaries. He goes, I've never seen anything like this. He says, people who were literally trying to kill each other seconds ago are now helping each other up. And it's like the, everybody took care of the wounded. Everybody took, uh, even when the dead were buried, they would bury a Yank and then a Brit and then a Yank and then a Brit. And it was like, uh, was all done that way. So we had had a plan for what to do with Barclay's sword at the end, which you know what happens to it at the end. The question was, if Barclay didn't surrender it to Perry, how does it end, end up in the hands of that one person at the end? Right. You know, see, Where how, it careful, needs to be. see how careful I am not to, yeah. to give anything away. Yeah. So 
And Linda was uh, was like, I, at first I wasn't going to change it. And she called me back later and said, she goes, Mr. Corgan, she goes, I'm having a real problem with what you plan on doing with Barclay's sword. Mm-hmm. It was not so much the actual what happens with the sword is used for. It would be like that Bark, she goes, because that's part of the relationship between, between Perry and Barclay is he offers him his sword and he says, you can keep it. In other words, this is it's a, a kind gesture to a brave enemy. So it was like, she goes, I really have a problem that you're not going to use that. So I said, okay, Linda, I'll write around it. And it's like, so we did it correctly. That's how it happened. It seems like uh, back then there was always like a, a much more mutual respect amongst enemies or combatants than there is today. Like now if I have somebody who's my enemy, I, I feel like I it's not... Right, it's like ruthless. It's not that I respect them and see well, their point of view. It, it's that I want them to, to lose or to be defeated or whatever. Whereas back then, they have this mutual camaraderie, and it's both like they're following a higher calling. You know what I mean? And once that calling has been settled, you know we can be friends again, or we can respect each other, or do whatever it is we got to do. And there's another point in the book that I that I won't really try to spoil, but <laughs> where uh, two men are about to duel and Oliver Hazard Perry comes in he's like no you're not fighting like you're <laughs> that, that happened and uh it, it's all based around like that mutual respect that uh understanding and compassion for one another despite being enemies and trying to take each other's life I the the one character in the duel is Lieutenant Senate who I discovered in Parsons diary because he was constantly fighting duels and mm-hmm. and and Usher Parsons is either fixing him up or somebody or it's like he killed so-and-so it's like so I got the picture of this hot-headed impulse and I was talking to Linda Bull about this, and she goes, and you know it was about a woman. I go, oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Of course. So it was, it was, that's, that's what they're fighting about. So this is going to be... Uh, so it, when I came up with his character and his persona, it was out of the diary, was that this was uh, obviously this guy's a hothead, and he's got a temper, and it's like, he, I will have my satisfaction. And it's like, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. Was there any part of the book that you found like difficult to write? Like any of the story where like there wasn't a lot of fact around it and you kind of had to take a lot of liberties with it or anything like that? I'm thinking. Um, hmm. I, I like being as historically accurate as possible because people don't know this stuff happened. Right. And it's going to become something cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's... Um, the the I wanted to write a book that was entertaining, like a page turner, so that somebody who really doesn't care about history would like to read it anyway. Mm-hmm. And but and then you learn the history by osmosis. That's right. like the you that's, trick them, trick them into yeah. learning history. <laughs> trick them into learning. Well, the problem with teaching history is it's all like. <clears throat> dates and places and names and it's all cut and dried and boring Mm -hmm. and it's like oh but it was anything but if you were living back then right like this is like oh this was high drama and intrigue right this was your life back then. yeah if you can find the right stories the history is very interesting and dramatic and it's uh, one gentleman said to me one time he says yeah it's the high story this is the story of humankind and it's like uh, uh there there was um i'm trying to think of Anything I, I had, I found it difficult to write. Would, I didn't really know the sexual mores of the period. Okay, this okay. is like, for instance, I've got a little bit of that in the book. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I'm not sure how it would have. Pl- I mean, obviously that's been going on since the beginning of time, right? You know, and certain pe- and mores are different from from different people, but. In Erie at the time, one of the one of the, now through the eyes of Father Egan, it was be, would be like that all these centers are coming to town right. and women of ill repute, and right. it was like so, uh, uh, and, and it was like he was like he he had this nice little village of four hundred people of God fearing people, and all of a sudden it was like invaded, invaded. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, I, I think we did that okay. That's like uh, yeah, it's going on. I mean when when Nancy Duncan says she can't get any sleep because of what's going on upstairs upstairs it'd be like okay and she's sitting by the fire and she discusses it and rebecca goes oh yeah i know (laughs) so it'd be like but that we're not getting into you know exactly what's going on right and it 
You said that you wanted to be a teacher, but you never ended up going down that path. What what were you doing instead? Well, I, I uh, changed my major from history to industrial psychology, and I was going. It's more about motivational studies and and uh, group dynamics and things things like that. I figured that figured then in perfectly with my another my, my next job as like a manager of people, mm -hmm. and try to get the most out of them. Um, had I been a history teacher. I'd have been a kick-ass history teacher. You know, I, I, this I, would have I, been, I can tell. You'd be good at I it. I would have been, um, when possible, I would have dressed up as the character, um, and I would have been the person. Or I would have hired a reenactor to come in and play that person. I had a friend who did a great Abe Lincoln. And I would say, well, President Lincoln's going to be in the class tomorrow. You don't want to miss this. And then have him walk in with a stovetop hat. And, and, and All the gear. And, right. and all the gear. But... <clears throat> I, I used to, when I was, before I met Abby and I was struggling with the storytellers, a lot of people, a lot of teachers knew that I'd been out to Little Bighorn. I had done a lot of interviews with a lot of different people. They knew I was researching it and they thought I'd be an interesting speaker for their social studies classes. So I did this on a high school level. It would be John Corgan Day and I would come in and it went from talking to individual classes to all of a sudden I'm in the auditorium and they're all there. Oh, wow. And, and it was like... One of the teachers said to me, though, she goes, I, Mr. Corgan, she goes, I want you to know that on the final, everything that you talked about, they all got right. In wow. other words, they were paying attention, which is the secret of learning. If, if, if you can get them to pay attention, they will learn. Absolutely. I love that. I always really liked, I, I'm personally a big I'm sorry, this microphone just scared me. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of history. I've always really liked it. And I felt like the... The teachers that I had throughout school, the history teachers in particular, who felt passionate about history, always made it so much easier yes. to learn. Because really, like, history is incredibly interesting if you have the right people teaching you mm -hmm. about it. And so I... I love that you are out there, like inspiring that love of history. Hopefully, in some other. Well, hopefully kids. that comes through in the books. Definitely. Is oh yeah. I want to reach out and grab you and pull you right in and let me tell you a story. Mm -hmm. Was there any part of of this whole story um, that you weren't able to fit into the book that you liked? Anything that you learned that you weren't able I to I left fit in? out some interesting characters because I, I, I can't have every single character who was in Erie in 1812 right. in the book. Right, Okay, there's a handful of them that you'll identify from chapter to chapter. Uh, like you were talking about the timing of the book. It's like, yeah, it'll go from day to day and all of a sudden it's month to month. But it'd be like, you've got, if, if I int introduce too many characters, then, at the, then in the book, I've got to have a glossary of characters so you can go back and go, now, who was this and how are they related to him? It's like, I wanted to avoid that. Mm -hmm. So I left out when, again, Linda Bola at the museum says, oh, it was a shame you couldn't include so-and-so. He's one of my favorite characters. And I go, well, I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate that I didn't put him in the book. You know, the, it's, it's like, oh, but Perry liked him so much. The two gentlemen that accompanied Perry to Pittsburgh were his two closest uh, friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, they served under him. They, he was their commanding officer, but they went with him everywhere. So this is, but there were others that did that too. And she was, she was, oh, it's a shame you couldn't have put, put them in. It'd be like, well, they're on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Oh, bummer. <laughs> So do you ever do any reenactments or anything like that? No, I enjoy them. I mean, this is, a, I went down to, I go to Gettysburg every year and it was like, a, it, sometimes a couple times a year, but I was down there <clears throat> for the 150th anniversary of the battle, which I think was 2013 and something like 50,000 reenactors wow. were there. And, I, and I'm talking not just the soldiers, but the women and children, they were all dressed in period. It was like you were going back in time. And Abby had mentioned uh, this one particular soldier who's buried in Edinburgh named John Milton Taylor. And I, I always, I, I located the spot where he died. And so when I go down there, I walk his last steps, let him know that I'm here. And you see the spiritual side of me. Yeah. So in 2013, though, I'm doing this and I can hear musket fire and cannon fire and all this stuff. It's like as I'm walking these these last steps and there was nobody in the field that I was that I was walking through but it was like uh, 
uh, it was like that was surreal. That it's supposed was, to be one of the most haunted places. Yes, it is in the United States at least. And the ghosts say hi. They're all there. And it, to me, too, it, it goes into into how the dead were interred. They were literally buried in a shallow grave, and they might have been rolled up in their own blanket. Maybe not. They were. They wanted to get them under the earth as soon as possible. There were thousands and thousands of them. And same at the Little Bighorn. It was like they were just rolled or covered up with some dirt or something like that. And years later, in the case of Gettysburg, one year later, they went back and collected the skeletons and moved them to the National Cemetery. But what that means is that those people, those, those, those men, uh, are still in the ground. All of the, aside from their bones, all of the things that make us human beings, our hearts, our brains, our blood, our humors, and everything else, are still in the ground. Um, there's an interesting character in the storytellers, um, Chief Crawler, who was a minor suit chief, and his son, his little son, 10-year-old, is killed at the Battle of Little Bighorn. What he does when he finds the exact spot where his son died is he goes out and collects the grass that's growing on the site, and he plants the grass in a basket. Mm -hmm. And he says to our detective, when he finally meets him to interview him, he says, what well, he goes, that's my son, or all that's left of him. So I, I kind of look at that at Gettysburg, or a little bit, is that the grass that's growing out there is the people that were buried there. Sure. Makes sense. Abby, what is your favorite part of like this process of working with John? That's a hard question because it's all really fun. I, <laughs> um, I will say for the witch's fleet, definitely the coolest thing was so like you know when you read a book that you're really into or watch a TV show or play a video game and you're just like completely immersed in it, mm -hmm. right? And then you have to put the book down mm -hmm. and go do whatever it is that you need to do during the day but your brain is still kind of like in that world definitely and you're you're seeing it through the filter of the book or the tv show yeah. right this book's about eerie right right and so having that there while we were doing this and walking on the bluffs where they probably stood and wading through cascade creek and doing all these things walking down french because one of the taverns is still there, right. tucked behind Hammett Hospital, you know what I mean? Right. And, like, just walking on the streets that these real characters in this book actually walked 200 years ago. Right. It was, like, <laughs> chilling yeah. in, in the coolest way. So right. Like, oh, my God. Wait, wait. I'm reading this really cool book, but whole, th it actually happened right here. I'm actually in this book right now. And yeah. I definitely had that feeling earlier when I was, like, downtown yeah. at Perry yeah. Square. Like, oh. I wonder if this is where so and so or who whoever's been here in the past. It's powerful stuff. Yeah, we, that was super cool. Abby and I waited Cascade Creek uh, a year ago today, and uh, they had chosen Cascade Creek because of its large flow of water. Which, as I looked at Cascade Creek, I don't see that. Of course, it's two hundred yeah. years later. Right. A lot has changed. But uh, I said to her, because she has walked Cascade Creek at least down a certain part, and I said, okay, I want to take it all the way down to the mouth. I want to go as far down as we can, which was impossible, but it was like we got down so that the water was up to our butts, and it was like, um, and I go, okay, I've seen enough. Yes, by the time you get that far down, there is a large flow of water through Cascade Creek. It's like, I want to see that. One night, I'm home writing, and I asked her where Mill Creek flows into the bay, and I couldn't find it on a map. She went out and looked. She gets up. She gets Mill Creek is actually like uh -huh. two blocks yeah. away from our house right here. She said, uh, the next thing I know, she's on... She's out there in the middle of the night with her, with her son, and <laughs> nice. she's and she's video chatting with me, and she's with the South Pier. <laughs> she's going down South Pier with her son. He's like running, a, a hip, and she's showing me everything. It was the coolest thing. It was like I just wanted to reach out and give her a hug. Like at that moment, it's like, oh, this is great. I think she's hooked. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was like, uh, but one of the, and then shortly after that, she took me out there, and we walked the pier together, and. Um, the one part in the book where the HMS Queen Charlotte tries to come down uh, the uh, the mouth of of the heart of the bay, I had uh, 
Captain Chris Kassan, who was is one of the ship's officers with the Niagara Lake, uh, when I was here last year, was kind enough to take me all through the Niagara, which was cocooned at the time. But <clears throat> I said, that's okay. I want to go completely below decks. I want to get the feel of what it was like to be in the ship where, where Dr. Parsons was operating on the wounded. I want to go to that place where he was operating and see what that room was like and how, how close it was and imagine it full of like wounded and dying men, all that. But then I, he and I were, and we were talking about, I said, about the, the HMS Queen Charlotte and I said, I don't see how the Queen Charlotte could have turned around because it's a narrow channel. And he says to me, he goes, oh, he goes, it was completely different back then. The mouth was much wider. And um, also, you're talking about sailing ships. It isn't that easy to turn around. Mm -hmm. In other words, the wind's got to be, and Chris says to me, he goes, they would never have gone down the channel unless they knew they could turn around. So the wind would have had to have been just right. So that when they're going to go down, they know they have to turn around and come back. So it was like, I went, oh, so that's how I wrote it, is, is that this is uh, Commodore Barclay judges the wind. He says, do I dare? And mm -hmm. he signals the HMS Queen Charlotte to try to go down the channel and lay some iron on those gunboats, which is all happened. That was like a really cool, even a lot of people I know who know about the Battle of Lake Erie don't know that that happened. So it was like, and again, it's Rebecca and Nancy Duncan, and there's like they're standing on the bluffs and they're like at a football game. They're yeah. cheering because this. I think it's Rebecca who says that when she saw the Queen Charlotte coming down the channel, she goes, "It was the biggest thing she had ever seen moving," mm -hmm. and she's describing how the wind and the way the wind would be going. The sails would like puff out and then let go, and then puff out and then let go. And she goes, "It's like it was breathing, like it was a sea monster, like it was alive, a living thing, a living thing." And it was like. Um, uh, and, and I can just see them on the bluffs, like cheering. It's like, yeah. yes, we did it. And they have to turn around and go back. So it was like, uh, I hope when I meet Nancy Duncan in the next world, she goes, hey, you did a good job. She gave me a high five. <laughs> right. Yeah, that'd be nice. Huh? Was Rebecca also a real character? Uh, there was a Rebecca, but I made her that, f for instance, like, like Q and JJ, Rebecca, okay. they're modeled after the real character. But mm -hmm. um but I used, uh, I just picked Rebecca out of thin air, the, okay. uh, the, the name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she was a real person. Right, okay. Because I just find it interesting that she is like a female soldier. Well, that was that common. Time? The, was well, it? they're militia. Okay. And, and, well, okay. and this was the frontier. There was, Cleveland didn't exist. Uh, Cleveland was 47 people living in log cabins on the, on the Cuyahoga <laughs> right. River. And it was like the biggest city to, in the west of the United States is Erie and then south is Pittsburgh. So it would be like, uh, but there, this is the frontier. So on the frontier, the type of woman who's on the frontier is right. a tough lady. A tough, tough lady. Yeah. Okay, She can handle a musket and an axe. She can chop wood. You know, it was like... Uh, uh, there's nothing that Rebecca can't do. So this is, uh, and that's how I portrayed her. It's like, and the idea that, you know, she runs out to save Daniel Dobbins. Right, you know, yeah, like, she was brave enough to go do that. Oh, yeah, she was an incredibly brave person. But that would be, to me, the typical frontier woman at okay. the time. You couldn't be a shrinking violet and be out here. Right, right, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Erie's always kind of had like a, a weird keep like a like a weird eerie kind of vibe you know we've always had like this witchcraft culture well maybe not a witchcraft culture but i can kind of see where any witchcraft culture that we do have comes from from your story and the the historical or historic uh you know stuff that was going on we also have like supposed aliens that live out in lake erie and that come to presque isle and all this stuff um was that like part of your inspiration at all to kind of when, Give a background to those kinds of things. In if you're the eerie witch, okay. If what she's doing is she's brewing teas and she's doing she's doing things that are almost when you compare what she's doing to what Usher Parsons is doing, you know, he's pouring acid over salt and he's trying to fume it. He's he's trying to find it. Well, so is she, mm -hmm. but she's using her potions. Abby does the same thing. When her roommates are sick, she brews this special tea mm -hmm. for them. And that's where I got the idea for that tea that she's brewing up. And it's, it's, it's why the doctor and all the people that work with Also, her, the medicine is actually... probably is, had it, it at least once. Is a, is a medicine that is commonly used 
as well, like the uh, poultice that they yes. make, the plantain. Yeah. Very common medicine for a lot of different things. When she, when Abby and I walked Cascade Creek, <clears throat> Abby was pointing out the plantain to me. And it would be like, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it would be like, well, it was all over the place in 1813, too. So it was like they went down there to pluck the plantain and then make it into a poultice or I'm sure there was a bunch of they were experimenting they were it there's a quote that I use from Nietzsche in in a, a, do, do you really think and I'm going to paraphrase do you really think the sciences would have ever evolved what they are without sorcerers and witches and it's like because they were experimenting they were trying things and who knows what works what doesn't um, <clears throat> the idea of a clairvoyant uh, is really a different thing altogether. In other words, our young lady in Erie has visions, mm -hmm. and she trusts her visions. And it's like, and Perry buys into that because of his relationship as a midshipman in, in Haiti, was that he goes, no, I've seen witchy women. And it would be like, uh, and his quote was, he goes, I would employ them the way I employ my spyglass. In other words, they improve my vision. Right. Used as a tool for sure. Um, was it exciting for you to like kind of bring more light to that kind of like Wiccan and witchy um, world? I feel like not a lot of people are exposed to that. So, I mean, was that something that felt kind of important to you to be able to put that in a story that other people are going to be able to read? Like, was it exciting for you to do that? Yeah, you know, I didn't even think about it like that, to be honest. It's so... I feel like in our group of friends, it's pretty it's so well known, normal. But like I, it's it's really not something that's normal to everybody. No. So to be able to like bring that knowledge to light in a good way, and like you know, right. have, it is, have people possibly learn about it themselves and be interested in it. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm hesitant to use the word Wiccan, honestly. Yeah. Just because just because it's so new. Yeah, and a lot of people don't even know that. A lot of people think that that's like an ancient practice. It's not. It's so, so very new. And I'm not sure that, I don't think that would have been a thing back then. Well, right, I, right. I, I tried to use it and mm -hmm. she shut me down. <laughs> she yeah. goes, that, no, she goes, that wouldn't have been back then. I, I used like a Wiccan woman, you know, it's like yeah. a turn of a phrase and Abby called me on it right away. But like the people that have visions or use medicinal herbs or anything kind of like that that can be portrayed as witchy i think yeah that's really cool because it's when you get down to it i feel like a lot of that is also heavily stereotyped and made right. out to be something exactly. that's definitely not right and i just feel like the a lot of people who are into historical fiction or like eerie history wouldn't necessarily be people that are into like witchy things mm -hmm. so you're kind of like possibly you know bringing some new knowledge to light right. for them and like i know for me like that would be that would feel important to me and i think the way that you did that was very well done as far as how you portrayed thank you especially the eerie witch because most of most of them aren't out to be evil scary right creatures, well i know? had to get it past her mm -hmm. so it would be like knowing who my audience is right and that's what like john was only able to portray her in such a good light because of your like knowledge and input so well i could see as i was writing the witch the mm -hmm. eerie witch she was the my model right so it would be like this is how abby would do it this right. is how she would for one thing when she first she first talks to Father Egan in the confessional, and it's like she just she's in the. It's like oh my god, it's her, and she goes, "Listen, I need to talk to you, priest." And Abby got back to me right away, laughing. She goes, "That would be me." Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely got that vibe. I love that part mm -hmm. where she goes in the confessional with him at first, and just like scares scares him so bad, and it made me laugh. She says to him later, she goes, "You have been you have been told to fear me." Mm -hmm. by someone who doesn't know me right and it would be like this is and she says again she goes my friends are your friends you know i go to your services i sing your songs i'm in the you know so i'm your, right. this is like uh i'm not any di i think she says to him i'm not any different than you mm -hmm. so this is you know but he uses his prayers and his rosaries and his his beads and his incantations and all this stuff and she uses what she uses 
Right. It, it provides a, a positive light to things that people don't normally understand and are often afraid of. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. what's really cool that actually, I don't know if you, I don't think you even know this. What can kind of bring this full circle is that the woman that taught me, her name was Stormy. Um, she was like a second mom to me. She taught me all of that stuff. And she is actually part Lenape. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's, I think, Irish and... Lenape. Okay. And so that's... Yeah, and, Stormy was a super cool yeah. lady. Yeah. I got to meet her oh, did you? many years ago. She was definitely a, a cool witchy lady. It yeah, so it has a mixture here. of like the witchy and the native right. remedies as well. It's kind of like all tied together, which works out perfectly. For I that. think that when, when things work, they're adopted by all cultures. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Oh, Especially yes. in yeah. terms of like medicine or beliefs or anything and they all kind of blend together into like one little happy thing mm -hmm. it's exactly. just that when uh when people don't know or don't understand or see something as different or um out of their ordinary you know it results in fear which is uh also played like a serious part in your book the the fear of witchcraft and all that stuff especially back then i i actually wanted to do some more research about like when the salem witch trials went on in relation to this because it seems like that was a a very big motivation in the church was to like find these witches and stop these people from well, what was the, going on <clears throat> the the salem witch trials were like the 1600s mm -hmm. or early 1700s this would be like 100 years later at mm -hmm. least however the way i described it when she was in philadelphia and she had to flee was that there were rumors about her that she had these powers and even though no one there were no witnesses that ever said she harmed anybody they felt they should do something because people were afraid. And it was like that they, we, they feel we should do something. And so they try to apprehend her and she anticipates them. She knows they're coming. They're clairvoyant and she leaves. She, she goes out to Erie. So this is, um, that's the blurb on the back of the book. So that's, uh, which I was um, having dinner at a little spot uh, between here and Cleveland. I go back and forth all the time. And... Um, I'm sitting out on their, their veranda, it's a beautiful evening, and uh, I'm, I've got a copy of The Witch's Fleet, which has a striking cover by Patty Larson. And um, the waitress says to me, she goes, what are you reading? And so I talked to her about it, and I gave her one of my cards. I said, if you like to read, I says, you know, the book's available on Amazon or whatever you want to do. And I gave her the card, and she walked away. And like 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, I get a tap on my shoulder, and it's the three women sitting behind me. <laughs> And they have my card. They must have plucked it out of her hand as she went by. And I, I turn around, and they've got my card, and they go, what kind of witches are these? Uh -huh. And it was like, well, <laughs> it turned out that the three women were mediums, and they were on oh, their wow. way up to oh. New York for some type of... But it was like... Probably Lilydale. Lilydale, yeah. They were a little defensive, like, now, is this like Salem witch? And I so I, you know... I described it as best I could as like this is how and it's like and I showed them the blurb on the back you know that this is like so they I sold three books there at the table awesome I carry awesome. them in the trunk of my car so I'm, I'm always ready always prepared right, gotta be prepared yeah what's next on your agenda uh well the the next book um uh it, the working title is going to be called Deathless and mm. it's um it's about John Milton Taylor and people who don't die. Interesting. And uh, we're going to weave the, um, the vampire crypt at the Erie Cemetery into this. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I was just there like the other day. It was like, uh, and I've got the complete history of it. So, really? yes, which oh, is fascinating. And it goes back to that time period. It's a little iffy as to exactly when it was built and who's actually buried in there. So this is, but um, it has been set on fire. It has been, there's like a, a million stories about this, which we're going to use in, but um, I liked the term deathless. It's like people that refuse to die. Yeah. They just keep coming back. This is, and it's not, it's not about vampires. It's just about people that are immortal. It's like they die, but then they come back. Yeah. It's like they're still walking the earth. So that's the next one. It'll take me a year to write it, and then it, another eight months for it to turn into a Have book. Have you started yet? Yeah. Abby, has he started yet? Is it good? <laughs> uh, it's uh, um, the very first line. I finished the first chapter. The very first line is, 
he had already been dead for 113 years, but he mm. still enjoyed a walk in the sun. Wow, well, I'm <laughs> awesome. intrigued. Well, that's yeah, line one. Right. It's like the best line. first line I've Can't ever wait. Heard. Yeah. So awesome. I have one last question. Sure. Um, so, what advice would you give to somebody who's trying to write their first book? Write. In other words, I was. <clears throat> When we were at the Tall Ships Festival, I had two people come up to me and talk to me about writing and, and doing it. It's like, just write. And by that, I mean, I'll sit down and write, and I can almost guarantee you that first page is going to be crap. Okay. However, it, it primes the pump. And it's like, then it starts to go mm -hmm. and it starts, um, it gets a little bit better. And of course, you're always going back and polishing it and changing it. But the key thing is to sit down and write. Even if you're writing Mary Had a Little Lamb. Okay, this is like, go ahead and write it and pretty soon something good is going to come out. It's like, because the story wants to come out. Mm -hmm. There's uh, one of the, um, Jessica Taylor, Taylor says to me, she goes, has it ever occurred to you? She goes, that the people you're writing about are channeling through you? And because she says, like, you see this energy in me and this passion for what I do. She thinks that's the that's the, the explanation for the passion and the energy. Is this like, it's actually other people trying to get out. Right. So yeah, I had that definitely. thought during this interview, actually. Did you? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, that's not the only one. Well, she took me over to the vampire crypt. She goes, I want you to see this. And it's like, uh, and then she did all the research for me on the vampire crypt. So it was, it was like, uh, and I told her, I go, we're going to use it in the book. It's going to be part of it. Uh, but that's where the term deathless came from is that it's like, this is, um, and for me, John Milton Taylor, who was killed in 1863, he haunts me today. Mm -hmm. It's like, he's, he's always there. So it would be like, uh, um, it's a, you'll love the book. Good. You'll love it. I'm very excited. In two years, I'll, 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 I'll be back. Yeah, right. we can't yeah. wait. Good. We can't wait. Um, well, thank you guys so much thank for you. coming on. It was really fun doing this show with you guys and having you down here. Appreciate you making the trip. We hope your books do great. I can't wait to read Storytellers. Yeah. Um, anything you want to say before we cut it off? Anything you need to mention or plug or... I don't think so. <laughs> cool. Everybody go buy a copy of The Witch's Fleet. Yeah. I just took, took the words out of my mouth. John Corrigan. <laughs> it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's on my website, johncorriganauthor.com. It's right. like... Uh, Target and we're going to link all that stuff in, yes. our, in our social media blitz when this uh, podcast is getting released. Good. So thank you guys all so thank much. Thank you yeah, very thank much. Thank you so Absolutely. much. It's been great. Woo. Everything at once. <laughs> <laughs>